Hi everyone and welcome to part two uh, of this lecture series on model selection. And this one is going to be about cross-validation. Um, and in particular, first of all, what is cross-validation and then what does it have to do with model selection? And we will try to answer both these questions in this video. Um, I will not have a code example because this follows later when we talk about the lasso where cross-validation is, is an essential yeah, part of, the, of the, the procedure. Okay, so more from a conceptual point of view, this is what we usually do during training, right? We minimize the in-sample loss, sample meaning we have n um, data points in, in a training set, but what we actually want to minimize is that we want the minimum of the out-of-sample loss, right? So the expectation when we draw our samples from a given probability distribution, the expectation of exactly this quantity, right? So y minus h of z given, or with the parameters, w. All right, <clears throat> and so we have a particular problem because we want to minimize this, we are actually minimizing this. And so the first question that would be interesting is, is it possible to take a peek at this one, even though we only have training data? Right? This would be a very good statement, or a very good tool to have at our hands. And then the next step will be, if we can actually take a peek, can we use this information to actually make additional modeling decisions? Okay, so, um, the question is how to get an idea of the out of sample loss, right? So precisely this quantity. How do we get an idea what the out of sample performance actually looks like? And the idea is actually very simple. Um, we split the data set, okay? So what we have is, this is what I'm going to call D, which is our set of tuples Zi and Yi, whereas this i goes from 1 to n, okay? So we can simply split it into different parts, right? And so let's do it visually. Let's just assume that this is our data set. So this is our D. And then we just set it apart into three different parts, right? So let's say this part is what we call training data set or D train. Okay. And then we have a second part. Or well, let's say we have a third part. This is our test data set. Okay. Why test? Because this is something we are never ever going to touch unless we have made a final decision on our model. Only then can we use the test data set to estimate the out of sample performance. Right? This does not, cannot be involved in any modeling decision. <clears throat> and so you may have noticed that I left some space in between these two. And so there's a third category of data, which I'm going to call dvel for the validation data set, okay? And so this one is different from the training data set because it is not used heavily to train a large number of parameters, but it's also not a test data set because it's not just used for validation, it's going to be used for something in between, right? We, we are going to use it to make some small, low-dimensional modeling decisions. So this is the model selection part, if you wish. Um, and so what we're going to use this for is, for instance, to estimate <clears throat> parameters like the, the regularization parameter, maybe the, the number of iterations after which to stop a deep neural network training algorithm and so on. So this is in between. <clears throat> and what's really important here is the question of contamination of the data, right? So, so 
So what I mean by this is how well suited is this particular set in giving an estimate of the out of sample performance. Okay, and so this is very easy. The training data set is very much contaminated, right? But we use it to make every single decision on the weight vector. So we cannot use it to estimate the auto sample performance because we have tailored our model parameters to this data set. So this will give us a very optimistic bias in terms of what the auto sample performance is. You know, we have tailored the weights to exactly this data set. Um, and then we have the test data set. This is totally clean. What I mean by this is what I said in the beginning, we are never ever going to use it <clears throat> for anything just after we have fixed any decision and trained the model and have a final model, can we use this one to give an estimate of what the out of sample performance is and how well the model generalizes. And then we have this in between, the validation data set. And this is slightly contaminated. So what I mean by this <clears throat> is that we use it to make a few decisions, not many, you see, well, the sizes are not definite here, obviously, but they indicate that the validation set is usually a lot smaller than the training set, <clears throat> which means you cannot use it to make many decisions, it's just smaller, but you can use it to make some informed decisions, right, like a, a learning problem after another learning problem. I will comment on this in a second. And so let's, you know, this is pretty abstract, but let's use an example to study this, okay? <clears throat> and the example is going to be that we have an additional term, which frequently occurs, a regularization term, right? And for now, let's just use the two norm, so Tikhonov regularization, um, and ask the question, what about this lambda value? Okay, so it's a small, in, in dimension, a small decision because it's one parameter, but it's nevertheless highly important how to select it, right? If you set it too large, you will basically put emphasis on the, the W, so this one will dominate the loss function and you will basically have a small weight vector. And if you make it too small, the lambda parameter, this means this doesn't matter too much and you will only focus on this one and this leads to overfitting if you have a large number of of weights. So this lambda parameter, if you choose it wisely, will help you to avoid overfitting because you're forbidding two large parameter values and this has favorable um, properties in terms of, of generalization. Okay, so what's the procedure for selecting the lambda? So it's actually Quite easy. First of all, we fix lambda to some value and then we train the model, so we minimize our loss function on the test data set. Sorry, on the training data set, obviously, right? Excuse me. <clears throat> this is very important. So we train on the training data set. This is why it's completely contaminated. It, cannot give you any estimate of the out of sample performance. But then, after we have trained it, we can assess the performance using the validation set. Right? So this means I can use the validation data set to take a peek at the out of sample performance and this gives me a good option to assess what this lambda parameter does for me in this specific setting. Because the next thing is simply repeat for different lambda. Right? So we go back, we train again, we assess the performance. So basically what this gives you is a loop from here 
back to here, assessment, repeat, right? And so what you can do now <clears throat> is in the end, you make a final assessment and this will give you, let's say, lambda star, right? The optimal choice from well, the tests you have performed, okay? So this is the idea of validation and model selection based on this validation data set. And so if you think about it, we have a learning problem and then we have on the validation set just a second learning problem, okay? Select out of a finite number of model options the best model given training data. So for your, 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 your hyperparameter selection, this is now our training data set. And so that's a difference, obviously, because this is a small set and it's only used to make a choice on a few parameters, okay? And then theory will tell us if this is a low dimensional parameter, a smaller set will be sufficient to make a good choice. All right, so this is what validation is about. One thing that we have not addressed yet is the problem or the issue that the size of the validation set has a negative impact on the amount of training data that we have, okay? So let's say the detrain, the cardinality of the set, so the number of samples that we have will go down. And this is obviously a problem for us because we know the more data we have, the better. And this is good for generalization um, to avoid overfitting, you know, if you have a fixed number of parameters, you're Q in the training is fixed, but you reduce the number of training samples, you're much more prone to overfit. So this is the problem, and this is where cross-validation comes into play, okay? So the idea is quite simple. Let's consider this one. So I'm not going to touch the test set for now. So this is just the part that we use for training. We can simply split it into a bunch of subsets. Let's say these are capital, this is one till K of these subsets. And then we simply use cyclically one of these as the validation data set. So this would be the validation set in my first training run. So I train on two to K and validate on one. Then I train on one, three to K and validate on two and so on. So this would be my validation data set one, validation data set two, until my validation data set capital K, okay? And then I can use a cross validation error simply as the mean of these K training runs. So the validation loss for the jth run, okay? So actually pretty straightforward, and this is now very, very good to give us um, <clears throat> a training data set that does not shrink in size or does not shrink by much because we can make this validation set small. So we take only away only little from the training data set, but we still get a large validation set because cyclically we will validate on everything. And this is very helpful because you can imagine if the validation set becomes very small, so in extreme, for, uh, extreme case only one sample, we do not get a very good estimate out of this. So large validation set means a good estimate of the out of sample performance. Large validation set means reduction in the size of the training data set. And so cross-validation aims at achieving both goals at the same time. So you have both a small validation data set and a large validation data set because you repeat this multiple times. And so you're taking the mean of multiple validation steps and in the end you get a good estimate of the out of sample performance even though in every single case the validation data set may be small. So the plus size uh, idea is it gives you a small validation set 
This is good because we don't have this issue that the training data set is reduced. On the negative side, we need to repeat the training, right? So multiple trainings is something that we need to be able to pay for. Okay, so computationally it gets more expensive, but it has huge advantages in terms of the training set sizes and the validation set sizes. <clears throat> so for deep neural network training, you may run into issues because this gives you headaches in terms of the cost. For linear models, this is actually very, very widely used because it's a very good approach. And so the last question that needs to be answered, what is K? And so this is up to you as the experts. Um, very common is tenfold cross-validation, which means you split your data set into uh, 10 equal uh, sizes. So you repeat 10 times the training and for each training you have 90% of the data for training. But again, this is a personal choice and also depends a little bit on the model you're trying to train and on the problem you have and on the amount of data you have at your disposal. All right, so this wraps up our introduction to cross-validation. And next we are going to use this uh, in combination with a very popular algorithm which is known as the lasso. Thanks for your attention and see you then.